So as Joel unpacks his things, I will welcome everyone here today. Um, this is a panel on Iraq, co-convened by New America's uh, National Studies Program and the Middle East Task Force. I'm Leila Halal, co-director of the Middle East Task Force. Um, and as I'm sure all of you are well aware, this uh, panel was precipitated by um, the U.S. military withdrawal from Iraq at last month and uh, the political context that's contest that has been unfolding in the country. Um, we are joined today by uh, experts in the situation in Iraq and people who have some strong opinions and insights, um, and we look forward to a very in, um, thoughtful and enriching debate about the situation. I've asked the panelists to avoid getting into any polemical discussions about the merits of the U.S. withdrawal and, of course, uh, would ask the audience also um, to, to, uh, to try to focus a bit on uh, what is the situation in Iraq today and, and what are the prospects going forward. Um, the first speaker will, is uh, Doug Ollivant. He is a senior national security fellow with the New America Foundation. He is a recently retired uh, army officer and director, uh, and his last assignment was a director for Iraq at the National Security Council under both the Bush and Obama administrations. Prior to his posting at the White House, uh, Doug Olivant served in Iraq as chief of plans for the multinational division Baghdad from 2006 to 2007. He um, worked with uh, General Petraeus and was very much involved in sort of um, this the battle, if you will, um, in Iraq during those those uh, seminal years. Um, he is a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the, uh, the Veterans of Foreign Wars and American Political Science Association, and he currently is advising a number of com com companies on strategy and political risk. Uh, seated next to him is Ray, uh, Joel Rayburn. He is a U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel with 18 years of experience in intelligence and political military affairs. He is currently with the Center for Strategic Research at the National Defense University's Institute for National Strategic Studies and also a senior fellow here with New America. Um, Joel served also in Iraq at a different period than uh, Doug Ollivant. He was in uh, Baghdad from 2007 to 2008, also working under General Petraeus. Um, to his right is Rahman al Jabari. He is a senior program officer for the Middle East and North Africa at the National Endowment for Democracy. He is engaged, or has been engaged, with capacity building in Iraqi civil society for uh, the past eight, eight to nine years. Um, he was, he served as the National Democratic Institute's NDI's deputy country director and director of civil society an election program in Iraq. He was also uh, served as the Iraqi community coordinator for the Iraq Foundation in Washington, D.C. He um, has undertaken various initiatives for uh, civil, with civil society in Iraq, and that includes uh, his recent initiative, the Marat Media, a monitoring network that is playing a leading role in monitoring the Iraqi government. Um, please, I welcome Doug to uh, pr make the first uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Layla. Um, I'm privileged to be here today. I look at the audience. I see not only a, a lot of uh, native Iraqis, but a lot of my former colleagues from both Baghdad and the, uh, the Washington interagency who worked Iraq. I'm pleased to have all of you here, and I'm uh, very cognizant that many of you know just as much about this as I do and could just as easily be standing up here talking, and I look forward to the question and discussions we have with you. Um, on behalf of all the panelists, um, we were originally asked to prepare for 15 minutes, then we all met before this and we started just debating among ourselves there, and uh, Layla asked us to all compress down to about five minutes so we could get more time to discuss this both among ourselves and with you, um, so all of us may sound a little bit rushed in uh, how we present these initial comments. Um, my bottom line take on the situation is uh, 
as we all know, there are three primary ethno-sectarian groups in Iraq. The Shia are in charge. They have one, um, but they still have trouble believing this. They have a, you know, they have a, a history, not only recently in Iraq, but a long-term uh, religious history of oppression. Uh, to be Shia in some ways is to remember and remember that you're a victim of oppression. That's part of, uh, you know, very deeply ingrained into Shiism from its very beginning. Um, and of course, most recently in Iraq, suffered under the Ba'ath regime, um, several purges. Uh, we all know the history of, of several of those. And of course, many of those members, many of the senior leaders of the government lost close members of their family to the last regime. So are deeply scarred and uh, probably still wake up you know, with nightmares that the Ba'ath Party is coming back. And we always need to be cognizant of that, the, the deep um, fear of the Ba'ath Party of Sunni uh, domination of the Shia um, after you know, decades of it. The Sunni um, in Iraq have been defeated. That's really the bottom line. They are the losing party in a civil war. We always need to keep that in mind. Losing parties in civil wars tend to get less than their fair share in the aftermath. It's a stubborn fact of life. And third, the Kurds, who are punching well above their weight. Um, they've achieved de facto sovereignty in the north. They've achieved some amazing things, both in terms of their political institutions and especially in terms of their economic development. They are very vested in the status quo. They are very, very vested in peace. They've got a really, really good deal going, and they know it could all disappear in a couple weeks were Iraq to plunge into violence again and were the Kurds to be a part of it this time. They, they, as we know, they escaped the, the violence of the last period. There's a terrorism problem in Iraq. There's not a sectarian violence problem, a large-scale one, but there is a terrorism problem in Iraq, largely driven by the nihilist al-Qaeda in Iraq. Um, most of the recent violence we have seen, I believe, is totally unrelated to the current political crisis. Um, my assessment is that al-Qaeda in Iraq wanted to embarrass this government in the wake of American withdrawal. They wanted to make the case that this government could not secure Iraq. They have stockpiled um, their, their car bombs, they've stockpiled their weapons, and they are using them against this government in the wake of American withdrawal. Totally related to American withdrawal, totally unrelated to the current crisis between pri the Prime Minister and uh, various other factions. The security, the Iraqi security forces um, are capable, to some extent, of maintaining security inside the country. As has been well demonstrated, they are unable to defend their borders against uh, other states. However, I'm, I'm not too concerned about this. Let's, all, let's be honest, the only neighboring state we are concerned about is Iran. And were Iran foolish enough to do a high-end conventional attack against Iraq, Iraq would have more allies than it would be able to handle, from us to the Saudis um, and other players in the region. So while there is no formal security decree, um, agreement, no formal security guarantee for the Iraqis, there is a de facto security agreement, uh, security guarantee. They really don't have to worry about an Iranian invasion, or at least not for very long. Um, at the high end, which is not to say the uh, Iranians won't continue to do other things at a much lower level. Uh, the current crisis in Iraq, I think it's just the latest crisis in Iraq. It's hardball politics, uh, Iraqi style. It's a rough neighborhood and they play rough. Um, but when we should monitor this, we should be concerned about it. We have interests, we should try to temper it. Um, but we need to remember there are some checks on power, even if the Constitution is not as sufficient to check as uh, the Prime Minister and his office as we would like. However, we have to remember that we've heard the sky is falling in Iraq several times. Um, I remember hearing that the sky was going to fall when the Iraqi coalition uh, was disbanded there in 2008 and all the allies were sent home. Many were convinced that that meant the end of Iraq, it would fall into chaos. Uh, when the SOFA was signed, I was told by several people, Iraq is going to fall into chaos. It did not. When uh, American troops withdrew out of the cities, many assured me Iraq would fall into chaos. It did not. Um, and uh, when we went down to 50,000 soldiers, I was assured that that meant that Iraq would fall into chaos. It did not. Um, and now at the American withdrawal, uh, again, we're hearing this. Um, so yes, is there a crisis in Iraq? Yes, there is. I would say we have a, you know, a very short historical memory. We need to look back. There was, there was one about nine months ago. There was one about nine months before that. They muddle through them. Um, we need not to overreact. Um, 
Issues with Iran, I'll leave for the, uh, the question and answers. Um, I'll just state that our concerns with Iran are real, uh, but they are overstated, and I've uh, said this in public several times. Uh, moving forward, American influence in Iraq. We need to understand what the Iraqis want from America and what they will agree to. Uh, we've not been real, very good about asking the Iraqis, what is it that you want from the Americans and how can we help? Um, in some ways, we've uh, treated them as, uh, you know, as uh, clients, we told them this is what's your interest, this is what you need from us, and that may very, may, it may well be what they need from us, but it's still polite to ask. Um, so, my bottom line, and I'll close on this, uh, Iraq is ruled by a democratic regime, albeit one with an authoritarian past and some authoritarian leanings. However, there are very real checks on, uh, democratic checks on power. There will be elections. Um, if this government wants a budget and it needs one soon, it has to go through parliament. Um, as I've said elsewhere, the very fact that we could not extend the American presence in Iraq, and this is the only time I'll touch on it, um, is a, a democratic uh, it was a democratic check. The prime minister clearly would have appreciated American forces staying, as would some other forces. They couldn't get that through parliament. Uh, um, there is no overt sectarian violence, although again, there is a terrorism problem. These are good things. Uh, we tend to underestimate this. Quietest Shiism is the order of the day. Uh, Sistani and the quietest version of Shiism um, uh, is uh, very much the philosophy of the ruling party. Uh, the more activist, uh, theocratic Shiism is only, the, uh, you know, only held by a small minority faction, uh, largely among the Sadrs. Um, the Sunnis have it much better than is usual for the losing side in a civil war. Um, the, I, I suspect the uh, you know, American southern states uh, post our civil war would have very much liked to have had it as good as the Sunnis have it. And uh, Iraq is resourced well enough, thanks to its oil, uh, to continue its transition. Um, so unless you're vested in permanent U.S. bases, um, this is a fairly good outcome. It doesn't look that bad. Uh, as I tell people, my favorite indicator, you can now catch a Austrian air flight direct from Vienna to Baghdad. Who would have thought we would have seen the day? And uh, now, you know, life is contingent. Could Iraq go, you know, go a very, very bad direction? That's absolutely possible. But I think the likelihood is that Iraq will continue to muddle through. They will work through their politics. And... Uh, I'm uh, genuinely sanguine on the future of Iraq. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm pleased to be here. It, it feels like 2006 in so many ways, not just because of what's happening in Iraq, but because people are actually attending an Iraq event again, which hasn't been the case for several years. Um, I, let, let me start by by saying that what could be called the Iraqi Civil War did not end in 2008 and 9 with the Shia community of Iraq uh, defeating the Sunni community of Iraq with the Kurdish community of Iraq sort of, uh, as Doug put it, punching above its weight. Um, uh, having traveled to 16 of Iraq's 18 provinces, having met thousands of Iraqis on the street, in the neighborhoods, in the government, in the security forces, what I came away from uh, my experience in Iraq uh, understanding was that uh, identifying Iraqis according to their sect is deeply offensive to most Iraqis who have a deeply felt sense of nationalism and unity. And so when political parties who use a sectarian card in order to advance their narrow political interests wind up polarizing the country and having it spill ha having the effect of that being a, a spilling over of conflict on the local level where people who have never identified themselves in their lives foremost as Sunni or Shia or <clears throat> or or anything other than Iraqis are forced to make a choice just in order to survive the week. This is something that Iraq, that, that the vast majority of Iraqis were very happy to put behind them in 2009. So the fact that we're back to that point in 2012, where they're being forced to make this distasteful choice again, I think is a signal that things are going wrong in Iraq. Generally speaking, I think the two most significant political 
uh, legacies of the U.S. involvement of, in Iraq have been a system of government based on separation of powers, which is something that Iraq has never really had before, and a political accommodation in which Iraq's main parties all agreed to resolve their differences using the country's political system rather than force or violence. But both of these developments are now unraveling, and I'd like to discuss why and what it means for Iraq, and maybe in the question and answer period we can get to uh, what it means for the rest of us. First, let's talk about the unraveling of the political accommodation among Iraq's major parties parties, which is the, the factor that has secured the dramatic reduction in violence since mid-2008. Not even a month after the, the departure of U.S. troops, Iraq's politics are in disarray. I don't think anyone can argue with that. And there's no clear route back to stability. Whether driven by fear or tempted by an unmissable opportunity or both, Prime Minister Maliki and his Dawa party uh, took advantage in the first 96 hours without U.S. troops to purge their top political rivals. They ordered security forces to surround their rival politicians' homes. They issued an arrest warrant against Vice President Tariq Hashemi. They called for Parliament to remove Maliki's own deputy, Prime Minister Minister Salah Mutlaq, and they announced a terrorism investigation against Finance Minister Rafael Asawi. Taken together, these moves amounted to an attempt to decapitate Iraqia, which was, is the Sunni majority political coalition led by Ayat Alawi that actually won a plurality in the elections of March 2010. Now, there have been a number of opportunities in the intervening days since those first 96 hours for Maliki and his allies to defuse tensions, but instead they've mainly chosen to escalate them uh, when, when confronted. When Iraqia staged a boycott of parliament and the cabinet in protest against the pressure being applied to their leaders, Maliki responded by threatening to appoint his own loyalists to head their ministries and to form a new government without them. And when Iraq's Sunni communities began to demonstrate against what they perceived as Maliki's attempt to drive Sunnis out of a share of political power, Maliki's office announced a deal that would allow the Iranian-sponsored uh, militia Asaub Ahlal Haq, or AAH, to enter politics. When Vice President Hashemi sought refuge with uh, Kurdish President, uh, with, the, the, uh, with President Jalal Talabani, who is Kurdish, in Kurdistan, Maliki demanded that the Kurds surrender Hashemi back to Baghdad, and one of his parliamentarians, Maliki's parliamentarians, declared that Talabani should be charged with harboring a terrorist. And throughout the ensuing standoff, uh, Maliki's security forces have continued to conduct raids against Iraqia's offices and homes back in Baghdad. Every few days, it seems that the Maliki government, or to be fair, its, its opponents, take another small step towards the cliff, uh, past which lies sectarian conflict and possibly civil war. And every few days, this ongoing political struggle creates more space in which Iraq's sectarian militants on both sides can operate, both Al-Qaeda and the former Jaysh al-Mehdi, Shia militants, as the recent horrific bombings in, in Baghdad and in the South illustrate. They are not disconnected from the larger political crisis. Let me interject here, though, a word about sectarianism. The political developments that I'm describing have not been driven by sectarian motives, I believe. They are, instead, steps taken by one political faction to seize control of the state by pushing its rivals out of power. Prime Minister Maliki and the Dawa Party will play the sectarian card when it suits their interests, as they have done in charging some of the Sunni Iraqi leaders with involvement in terrorism, but they are just as ready to take steps against political rivals of the same sect when it suits their interests. And this is borne out by Maliki's current attempt to split the base of Muqtada Sadr's movement, which is Maliki's biggest Shia opponent, by inviting AAH, Asab Ahlal Haq, into the political process in order to set two wings of the Sadr movement against one another. It's also borne out by Maliki and Dawa's effort to strong arm uh, the Kurdistan regional government. Just in the past few days, Maliki and his allies have signaled that if Kurdish leaders are not willing to surrender Vice President Hashemi to Baghdad, then the Maliki faction will freeze the Kurds out of their share of national government by doing things like holding back the, the Kurds' share of the national budget or by removing the Kurdish uh, chief of staff of the Iraqi army, Babakur Zabari, and so on and so on. So the current near-term political crisis is marked by a Maliki and Dawa effort to fracture and emasculate its main rival on all sides, not just the Sunni side. Now, how can Maliki and Dawa be bold enough to challenge all rivals at once, you might ask? Well, it's because they've had great success in consolidating control of the state. As disturbing as the last month's developments are, they should not be surprising to us because they've been building for months now. For most of the past year, the question of whether to end or extend the U.S. troop presence in Iraq has obscured Dawa's campaign to take control of the Iraqi state for the long term. 
So let's talk briefly then about the unraveling of the second major U.S. legacy, the separation of Iraqi powers. Having signed an agreement with the other Iraqi parties in Erbil in December 2010 to share power, Maliki and the Dawa party have instead consolidated it through 2011 and they've steered the Iraqi government back toward the disconcertingly familiar territory of an authoritarian regime that uses state power to intimidate its political rivals and suppress popular opposition. Uh, this has been most pronounced in Iraq's security sector where until recently the Prime Minister held the positions of both Minister of Defense and Minister of Interior himself, uh, despite his agreements to share those portfolios with other parties. At the same time, Iraq's intelligence agencies and the physical security of the Green Zone itself, i.e. the physical security of the government, are effectively controlled from Maliki's office by, loyal, uh, by loyalists who include his national security advisor, his military advisor, and his son Ahmed. Now, having acquired the state's coercive power, Maliki and these loyalists used it in February and March to suppress uh, uh, another aspect of the Arab Spring uh, in demonstrations that took place in Baghdad and Basra and some other major cities in which the Iraqi security forces killed almost 30 protesters across the country in, in a branch of the Arab Spring that got very little notice. And then in October and November, the Minister of in Ministry of Interior arrested more than 600 former Ba'athist associates for their alleged involvement in what was an probable coup plot. And you all know about the arrest campaign that sparked the crisis last month. Now, the killing of protesters in springtime made clear that this is an emerging state that will not tolerate popular dissent, while the wave of arrests in the fall made clear that the National Reconciliation Project, begun with U.S. encouragement in 2007 and 8, is over. It's not just the consolidation of the security forces uh, that Dawa has been successful at undertaking. They've also consolidated independent entities that were meant to ensure checks and balances in the Iraqi constitutional system. Foremost among these is the Iraqi judiciary, which is under the effective control of the prime minister, uh, the integrity committee, and several other committees that are meant to be uh, meant to ex exercise oversight and watchdog functions of the rest of the government. These are now under the control of the prime minister's office, and even the electoral commission, which is meant to uh, ensure the integrity of Iraqi commissions is now coming under the sway of the Prime Minister's office. No one can say where the commissioner of the Electoral Commission is, Faraj al-Hydri. He's essentially in hiding uh, after being uh, brought under pressure by Prime Minister Maliki's office. Why don't I close there, and then in the question and answer session, we can deal uh, with with more of what the uh, of the consequences of, of this consolidation of power and the unraveling of the Iraqi political pact mean uh, for the region and for the United States. And I'll leave it for Rahman. Good afternoon. Since I have five minutes, and I left my notes there, so I don't need them. Um, we went to Iraq for so many reasons. One of them to establish democracy in Iraq. I'm not gonna talk about other reasons because it is not related to this topic. So if we examine Iraq now, what do we have in the country? Okay, we have a parliament that divided and has no power and cannot do anything. We have a government is for really short on Responding to the, it is citizen. Um, it has been terrible in 2003. Uh, delivery surface for citizen and it's still terrible right now. We have judiciary system in Iraq, which is in no way we can say it is independent and you can see right now with the vice president and um, uh, nobody believe in that system. Even the people who are vice president and the president himself. Uh, what do we have else? We have a political parties in Iraq. We have many of them. When I was started in Iraq, we have actually the database that I, some of my colleagues sitting here was 450 political parties. And I have never heard in any country in the world we have, they have 450 political parties. What do we have really a political party system? No, it's still Iraqi called individual. It is al-Maliki Jama'a, uh, al-Maliki uh, group, it is al-Jafari group, it is Jalal Talabani group, and it is personalized. The political party itself, it is that person, it is enterprise for that person. There is no system, there is no democracy within any political party. Okay, with all this we have, do we have independent media in Iraq? 
No, definitely not. It is controlled by the government, and it is all controlled by specific political party. So all these institutions are supposed to be the institution that hold people accountable in democracy. And if we don't have them, then we don't have democracy right now in Iraq. What left for Iraqis to, to build little hope on it? I think I'm watching the watch. I will keep my five minutes. You know, the military people didn't keep the five minutes. <laughs> um, but the, one of the legacy of the US actually is civil society in Iraq. Because we built some civil society. It is not strong, but it's still creating the debate about, about the issues. It's still sectarian didn't get to civil society. And when I say that, it is real. I mean, I can mention people from Mosul going to Hilla or to Basra to be on a board of director of own organization in Basra. But those are few. And they are weakening in general right now because the withdrawal of the military, although I'm not going to talk about it, left the, these people who are loyal to democracy, loyal to better life for Iraqi alone left them alone from security point of view, and then left them alone from financial point of view. Um, for Iraq to go successful, we need institution. And if we don't have institution, then we don't have the Iraq that we, I dreamed of when in 2003 left everything here in DC to go to build civil society. Um, I'll keep it maybe basically for the, a uh, question and answer, so I can keep my promise on my five minutes. Thanks. Thank you. I think the mic is on. Um, <clears throat> so I think we, we've heard at least two presentations which uh, paint a rather dire picture of the political scene in Iraq. Um, I think while Doug is a bit more optimistic in saying that um, th there, it, it's a quite, it's a, to be expected that following the U.S. military withdrawal, there will be a political struggle ongoing, and that this struggle will work itself out, uh, and that there is potentially still some hope if you take out the the terror concerns. Um, I think. I think we can b agree that um, there is, at the very least, uh, institutional weakness in Iraq. Um, there is a weakness in terms of the checks and balances. There, I there are divisions which are, are uh, maybe not geared towards sectarianism, but are geared towards uh, division, and uh, there is not a healthy uh, democratic uh, democracy at play in Iraq. So what I want to ask now, and I'm sure the people in the audience will have more specific questions, but what I would like to, to draw out from the speakers is um, more on what this means for the U.S. legacy. I mean, the U.S. was in Iraq, at least in part under the banner of democratization. Um, it went in militarily, but it uh, invested in uh, a provisional government in Iraq. It sought to build um, a new state, um, but but clearly it has not been successful. Um, and the question is, what what is, does this mean for the U.S. in terms of its ability to to leverage uh, transitions in the region generally and continue working within within Iraq? Um, what is the U.S. responsibility in Iraq? What what are its points of leverage, given that it's, uh, it no longer has the military there, um, and given that its credibility is, uh, is at stake? So w I would like to pose those questions to, to all the panelists um, to, to open the discussion. Um, sure, I'll start. Uh, again, we need, we need to remember that Iraq is eight, eight and a half years out of overthrow by a foreign power, and it's about four and a half, you know, depending on how you count, three to four years out of its civil war. Even were I to accept the characterization of politics that Joel gives, um, which I, I think is exaggerated, um, that would still be pretty good 
for this point. Um, and we need to understand this. When you, you know, decide to overthrow a regime and level its political institutions, um, the rebuilding of those institutions is a generational project. I'm sure there are people here in the audience who have extensive experience with, you know, building rule of law institutions. And those of you who do it know that it's a 20 to 30 year endeavor. Um, you don't create independent judiciaries on a single year timeline. You don't create a, um, a system of governments where legitimacy is given to all these counterbalancing institutions simultaneously um, in, an, in less than a decade. Um, so while I certainly can see that there are weaknesses, I mean, no one can deny that Iraqis political institutions are immature. That's clear. Um, but you know, grading on the curve for you know, a state where it is, uh, given its history, given where it just came from, um, given what it's gone through, we are, I think, well ahead of where we should expect this state to be, which you know, should be a cautionary tale for you know, other regimes that we're watching going through change elsewhere in the region. <clears throat> I'm, I'm all, like Doug, I'm, I'm all for setting the bar low. Uh, in, in terms of expeditionary uh, endeavors, but uh, I, I don't favor setting them so low that, that we lose U.S. interests. And were Iraq an island in the South Pacific, then I think we could maybe give it time to sort of to, to come to some sort of stable modus vivendi, um, and, and we could tolerate some level of political instability. But Iraq is not isolated. Iraq is in the middle of an important region. Uh, Iraq is an important state for us and for the world because uh, it, when we filter out the Iranian and Venezuelan propaganda about oil reserves, Iraq probably has the world's second largest oil reserves. And those are only going to become more important as demand rises in the future, you know, barring some sort of worldwide depression, which I'll leave to some other branch of New America Foundation to sort out. Um, but e even, if we, even if we set aside um, even if we set aside the political instability inside Iraq and the potential for civil war inside Iraq, the Iraqi government is slowly adopting a regional policy that is at odds with our interests. They are drifting into de facto an adversarial camp. They now have a foreign policy that is at odds with ours on the questions of Bahrain, on Syria, on the Iranian regime, and they have adopted a de facto hostile policy toward our Saudi allies in the region. So this is not something that we can just sort of draw a line around and then uh, choose to ignore while they get their internal house in order. This is something that affects us and it affects a vital, uh, a, a vital region in the world. And there's a, th there's a third reason. Uh, for those of us who have been watching the Arab Spring, Arab Awakening, and believe that this is an important set of developments uh, for the world, it's hard to imagine the Arab Spring coming to a positive outcome, certainly in the Northern Arabian Peninsula, if Iraq is undergoing a sectarian conflict or sectarian political in instability. And in fact, uh, right now, Iraq is on the side of intervening in the Syrian uh, crisis to shore up the regime of Bashar al-Assad in concert with the Iranians and with Lebanese Hezbollah. So this is not a problem. And, and in doing that, they're actually at odds with their own Iraqi Sunni citizens who are probably intervening on a much lower level to try and topple Bashar al-Assad in, in, in what may be a destabilizing way. So th this is why we can't just afford to walk away from Iraq as it gets its house in proverbial order. Sorry, just before you go on, but can each of you answer the, the question, which is, what are the points of leverage? If you can't just walk away um, and you don't have the military in Iraq, what, and, and you're, you've lost some credibility, to say the least, in Iraq, what, what are the points of leverage? I, 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 think walking, I, I think not having the residual military force did uh, we, we did trade away an enormous amount of leverage there. That, that's, that's unmistakable. We, we still, as a superpower, we still have a great many points uh, of leverage. We have political leverage. We, we do have some, uh, th there's, there's still some vestigial uh, role that we play inside Iraq in being uh, an honest broker among the different Iraqi parties. Um, there's the, our security assistance uh, to the Iraqi military, which is very significant. That's, I mean, that, that's a point of leverage. It, it's it's our, our ability to, to use leverage in international bodies, whether it's the UN or the, or the EU, other international bodies are also potential 
points of leverage. It's our, it's our ability to encourage uh, trade relationships and so on and so on. I mean, we, we, have, we still have quite a bit of leverage, but to be honest with you, to this point, I think it's largely undiscovered leverage. And Rahman, if we were to leverage these things, what, what should the U.S. be saying to, to Iraqis? Um, I mean, first, let us go back a little bit for fact. The U.S. need Iraq in that region, definitely. Iraqis also need the U.S. International neighborhood um, relation. Uh, Iraq is not a government right now can work the international by itself. You know, st Iraq is still under a lot of restriction from the U.N. Um, you know, to use that leverage to help the Iraqi to kind of get over this political struggle or struggling to control the power. I think still some, some of the Iraqi, I, I'm not going to talk about all the Iraqi. There are Iraqis who doesn't want us, who doesn't want to see us at all there. But the people who still respect our opinion, I think they are honest broker right now in the whole trouble. I mean, you see the embassy is not, has no role in what is going right now in Iraq. That's not happening in 2007, 2006. This crisis will not happen, will not last for long because there is internal uh, pressure on the, all the parties. That pressure, we just lost it. And I just want to go back to Doc when he said, you know, um, independent institution uh, need times. I do agree with him. I work in this field. But before the time, they need the environment to create the environment that they will be independent institution. Do we have or did we create that environment to be independent institution? No, but if we don't have that environment, then we'll never come. After even 30 years, actually it's the opposite right now. We're creating environment to uh, create a new dictatorship. Okay. Um. So we're open for questions. Do we have the mic? Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rasul Shihab, and uh, I'm Iraqi and former NDI staff. Um, uh, I've been in Iraq a couple months ago, and I'm kind of like seeing what's going on there in terms of um, political measure and also to see the people uh, suffering is also there. So my question is now, um, after to see all the facts um, going on today, um, do we should uh, to grow a fear from the government uh, the current government right now in Iraq, who actually start to kick um, either Sunni or do this and that and trying to uh, eliminate all um, the allies and put it in one hand. Um, when I talk to the people in the street, they say, well, um, I wish we wish uh, we go back to the Saddam Hussein time because at least we have electricity and we have service. But now there is nothing, just a political uh, fight. So. Do we have to grow a fear from the current government to be another dictatorship in Iraq? Thank you. I'll take a few questions. Uh, over here, this side of the room. I'm uh, Mark DeWeaver with Quantrarian Capital Management. Um, what I'm wondering about is the Iraqi army um, uh, can anyone uh, comment on uh, how, how, um, how should we say this? In other words, is the Iraqi, should we think of the Iraqi army as sort of a um, non-political professional sort of army like the U.S. Army, or is the Iraqi army dominated by one or another uh, faction, one or another political faction? Thanks. Here, there, front row. Thank you. Ahmed Barakat from MBN, Radio Sawa. Um, with the uh, struggles going on uh, on on every aspect, uh, political uh, security and and uh, on the level of service for the for the citizen, uh, how realistic is it that the um, American uh, uh, U.S. Uh, forces will 
uh, agree to another agreement, if, if the Iraqi uh, government would ask for another agreement to, to bring back uh, uh, a small force or whatever that is needed to stabilize, if this were to continue for months uh, in the future. Okay, I'll let the panelists answer. Doug, do you want to start? Um, sure. I mean, I, obviously, I, I don't, none of us here can speak for the administration, but I think that were the Iraqi government to come to the United States, um, ask for some type of you know, force, whether it be training or intelligence assistance or what have you, and you know, be willing to concede the immunities question, which is why we didn't get there in the first place, and that's a major caveat, the, the, the Iraqi parliament would be, have to be willing to concede immunities to those American forces. And that's, that's a huge caveat, and I don't think that's going to happen. But were that to happen, I think, the, uh, I think America would have to consider that seriously. Do you want to answer that? Uh, go ahead. Okay. Do you want to go ahead, Roman? Um, you know, I think for the agreement, we, the Iraqi will not come to the U.S. again. Literally. It's not in the interest of a lot of groups in Iraq. And when I say their interest, even to get violence, chaos, they still get benefit of it, so they are not coming back to the US. That's given, done. And even the prime minister cannot go to the parliament, so whatever, because that's basically political society for him. Uh, on the independent of Iraqi army, you know, the gentlemen both work with the Iraqi army, but for me as a dual citizen, Iraqi citizen, I think the Iraqi army is a collection of militia. And, and that's basically came with the prime minister, Jafari at that time, burden all the militia and brought them to the military. So it's really, there's no systematic military there. You know, you could say, yes, they are good, they are whatever, but end of the day, I have a family and my family is still in Hella, end of the day, the people on the militia from Hella, if there is a, they send them somewhere, they will not go somewhere else. Plus, they will, if there is a conflict between Hella and Karbala, the people from Hella will take the side of Hella. They are not gonna follow order, and that's exactly where, when we, a lot of people talk about coup in the military, there is no coup in the military in Iraq, because they don't follow order. I mean, that's my opinion as a civilian. I leave it to them. For the fear of government, um, I think the Iraqis share with you, Russell. Uh, the, there is a fear of government that has a $120 billion budget. And they don't see that the $120 billion but for the good of the people. It is good but for a good of political party leaders, and it's good It's for corruption. 120 billion, and we still do get one hour electricity? No. I mean, that's basically on the agreement. And we don't have any agreement right now with on the military side. And the SOVA is over. Mm -hmm. So there is no any agreement right now between the Iraqi government and the U.S. government on military. And I don't expect one unless it is, you know, uh, just tied to the military, I mean, tied to the... Uh, selling arm or something, but we don't have one right now. I, I, I would just say, yeah, I'd agree with Rahman. That there's on the, on the fear of the government or the possibility that, that a return to a Saddam-style system would be a more effective system of, of government. I mean, there's no, <laughs> the consolidation of control of the, of the government institutions under Prime Minister Maliki and the Dawa Party has not yielded any increase in effectiveness. The, this, the government is no closer to being able to provide electricity, water, sanitation, housing, transportation services than, than they were at, at the beginning of the, and, and they're not going to be. This is, be, because when, when you appoint ministers, when you appoint directors general, when you appoint uh, officials down to the very local level based on political loyalty and political you know, utility as opposed to their competence, their effectiveness, then you have a state that is that is poised to hold on to power, but not to use it to to effectively provide services. Um, on the Iraqi army, the Iraqi army was politicized in, for, when when I was in Iraq, 2006, seven, and eight. Um, they're not under any lighter political pressure now than they were back then. Um, so w you have 
you, you do have, as, as Rahman described it, a collection of a sort of assimilated militias. I would say, I would add that that's against a backbone of the old Iraqi Army Officer Corps, uh, which is a professional officer corps, but commanders are under enormous political pressure. Commanders are appointed based on their political, uh, on their political stripes, and, and they all know that. And, and they can be chucked out based on their, uh, on their political leanings as, as well. And for example, the finance minister, Rafael Asawi's brother, we learned yesterday, was just forced into retirement. If, uh, he's a brigadier in the Army, probably because of his association with, with the finance minister. Um, I, would I would say I don't speak for the administration or, or DOD, but I, as in my individual view is that a follow-on status of forces agreement in, in Iraq is is not going to happen. It's unrealistic. We, we might have had an extension while we were there, but the idea that we would go back in now, I mean, n nobody who's in a decision-making uh, capacity wants it on any side. Okay. Um, we're going to start in the back and move forward. Thank you again to the panel. Um, I'm Samir Lawani. I'm from MIT. And I want to go back to the question of uh, leverage and interest that was posed earlier. Um, I wanted to understand a little bit more about the scenarios for leverage. Uh, one of the things that seemed to sound like the most credible was sort of cutting off security assistance or other sorts of assistance to uh, compel you know, changes either in government or uh, institutions. But does Iraq have any plausible substitutes to kind of wiggle out of like uh, that, that leverage, whether it be other donors or, you know, it's uh, oil sales. And then the question of interest, leaving aside uh, moral responsibilities, uh, given that we have a lot of geopolitical co uh, competing priorities, uh, what are the actual sort of reasons why we need to be focused on Iraq? It seems that if the Shias have defeated the Sunnis, that the risk of sort of a, a civil conflict that sort of spreads throughout the region is less likely. It seems that Iraq doesn't really pose a conventional threat to its neighbors. It doesn't really have sort of a nuclear capacity. And, you know, the threat to oil sales uh, seems like unlikely given that they have just as much an interest in selling oil as we have in buying it. So go back to that. You know, I, I think you make some really great points. I mean, the, the relationship between Iraq and the United States needs to become much more reciprocal. Um, they have oil in the ground that they can't get out. Um, we have lots of people who are really, really good at this, who, you know, live in Texas and North Dakota. Um, you know, they have lots of money and they have a security deficit. Um, we have lots of, you know, uh, arms and military defense companies. Um, who aren't going to be selling much to our Pentagon in the coming years and would love to have another market. Um, there, there are clear matches between U.S. and Iraqi interests. And I think that's what we need to find um, in the coming years is how we put this together, mostly commercially. Um, and that was, uh, you know, since, since Joel touched on it, this was part of my, uh, the reason that I was a, a fan of getting the United States military out of Iraq is they were a barrier to U.S. commercial companies coming in um, they, they were not helpful. In many cases, they physically threw American businessmen out of the country despite their having valid Iraqi visas. Um, it was time for us to move to a next phase, uh, get the military out of the way, and let a, you know, an equal bilateral commercial relationship uh, build between Iraq and the United States. And I think there's a very clear natural fit uh, for you know, their needs, our requirements, and vice versa. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to ask Rahman to respond to this. Um, for the market and donor and <coughs> oil and, you know, the Iraqi need the U.S. You know, if you talk to the <laughs> Iraqi also, they, I mean, all, also if you see a lot of contract on the oil right now, mostly it's not going for the American. It's going somewhere else, you know. And for the sale of weapons and military, it's, you know, the Iraqis try to get the Chinese, the Ukrainian, the everywhere. I mean, yes, we have 16 or uh, 32 uh, F-16. 32. Yeah, and it's still it is kind of, you know. But there is still, you know, s I mean, secure, safe Iraq is good for the whole region. It is good for the U.S. It is good for the, uh, the Middle East in general, security-wise. Um, Iraq is, yes, it is bad, but... Um, we, let us not forget, Iraq has two good things in it. 
they have the resources and they have uh, the human resources that they can come over the challenge pretty good. So now with the, also with the change in the, in the whole uh, political system in the Arab region, who we trust, you know? So it's going to Iraq, it's like, it look, really the paradise for the US policy right now more than anything else. You have Egypt in one hand, you have somebody else. There is no a place you can say these are a friend as of us right now and we can work with them. Um, but can you work with the Iraqis? I mean, is, it, is the climate ripe for US companies to go in? Is it ripe to have uh, bilateral reciprocal relations? Um, if the US is promoting legitimate, accountable governments um, it, it, in the other parts of the region, is it able now to engage with the Maliki government? Look, Maliki cannot secure anybody going with a private sector going to Iraq. You need a safe, secure country. So the, you need a system, not Maliki, not whatever. You need a system in Iraq that allow people to go in. You know, business, I think that I was there. It's like almost the American company come with, because the military can save them or to, can help them. But now there is no security. There is no unity in the country. And what a contract you make today might be not working tomorrow. So business is not going to go to Iraq unless there is a system and there is laws and it is clear. Now they will go through corruption. You have to pay corruption to somebody else to let you in. And, you know, and also, by the way, visa right now to Iraq is controlled by the prime minister office. So any sit American citizens want to go to Iraq right now, they get the approval from the prime minister office. And that's basically you need at least eight months, nine months to get that visa if you can. And if you go to Kurdistan, they give you the visa, but if you pass the border to Kirkuk, they will arrest you. Absolutely, they will arrest you, and I'm telling you that um, from experience. So you go to Kurdistan with no visa, you jump to Kirkuk, you get arrested. And if you need a visa, you're gonna go to the prime minister office, and eight months. So if I am a businessman sitting for here in DC, for eight months for my visa to go to Iraq. I'm not going there. Okay, uh, we have one in the back and then this gentleman uh, midway through. As Samar Chatterjee from Safe Foundation. Um, uh, I guess uh, we've at least observed from all three presentations that uh, uh, American invasion of uh, Iraq has not worked. Uh, and also uh, we see the way things are going in Afghanistan and the recent negotiations with Taliban, that hasn't worked too. So given that, I hope uh, uh, we have this lesson that the United States would stop dreaming up more invasions uh, of different countries and I hope uh, America learns its lesson after hasn't learned it since it was defeated in Vietnam and thrown out, and now it's going in again into Asia Pacific. I don't know to do what, but uh, given that, I hope this is a lesson we have learned. Thank you. Okay. Um. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is John Pilsen. I work for 3P Human Security. I, I appreciated uh, the comments of Ustad Rahman on uh, about civil society as uh, offering hope for for the future. If I'm a congressional staffer in the in the U.S. Congress, what are three or four things that you can recommend? Concrete, realistic things that the U.S. Uh, can do through policy to encourage um, political, even cultural space for civil society to have a strong voice in the future of Iraq. Um, in, in the current context of Iraqi politics. Thank you. you uh, why don't we take this question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, it is simple. These people need resources, and I'm saying resources in different way, not just financial resources. And we need to stand with them, and that's the cheapest things. It's, you know, four or five million can build a real good civil society in Iraq. If we're talking about resources. Also, we need for all our institution here in DC 
to look really what's the problem, get it from the people themselves, not a design program here, and we go hire Iraq to implement the program. And that's the huge mistake we did early, kind design program and looking for Iraqi to implement it. And then when they implement it, we created the gap between them and their community. So please keep supporting civil society, keep engage them even here in the in the uh, in Washington DC. Give them the connection to come here. Give them the space to tell the story of it is not a uh, sexy story to get a civil society organization successful in the south because nobody care about it. it it's really we need to invest in civil society. We need to encourage our, even our senior people who are going to Iraq, don't just meet with Maliki and meet with Talabani. Make it part of your visit, sitting with these civil society <coughs> organization. Because then you empower them in their community and you tell them we think about you. Can I, can I respond to Mr. Chatterjee's observation? Uh, his, his uh, I, I disagree with the, with, with the premise uh, because what's happened in Iraq was not inevitable. It, it didn't flow naturally, inevitably, from the invasion of 2003. I mean, there was a window of opportunity um, for a different outcome in Iraq, and we made a couple of strategic errors that uh, allowed the window to close. If you look back to the end of 2008, uh, through a good part of 2009, there was the potential, especially around the provincial elections, which, which uh, resulted in the defeat of every incumbent party in every province that had an election, and the wholesale rejection of, of the incumbents who were um, uh, Islamist parties. There, there, was, there was space for cross-sectarian, nationalist political coalitions, Sunni Shia deal-making, Arab Kurd deal making and it and that was the proper that that was the potential for a pathway to a, a stable and largely democratic Iraq um, but at the at the beginning of 2010 when the the debathification committee which was under essentially the direction of Ahmed Chalabi and his and his subordinates um, played the sectarian card again and they acted like Iran's guardian council, and they eliminated hundreds of, of candidates from their rival political parties. That polarized the political process on sectarian lines. Um, and it was ultimately with the tacit support of the prime minister and his party. And that, that poisoned the well. And really, I think the national unity government was doomed because of that polarization and that poisoning. Our mistake was it was a crime of omission that we didn't use our political leverage, which was quite a bit more significant then than it is now, to try to put a stop to this polarization, to try to nip in the bud um, this reintroduction of, of the sectarian <coughs> framework. Secondly, our decision to reduce troops by 50% during the period of government formation interregnum in 2010 signaled to the country that we were more interested in the security of the ballot boxes and the security of the polling stations than we were in the political outcome itself. And it also signaled to Iraqi leaders who were casting about for external support our lack of commitment. And I think that's why we're in the boat that, that we're in today, because we traded away our, we failed to act when we had the leverage, and then we traded away a great deal of the leverage we had when it was needed most. Okay. Uh, Rahman, I just have to ask a small question and, and hope that it's of interest to the audience. Um, if we stipulate that the U.S. policy encouraged sectarianism, um, and now we are, you are making the case that the U.S. needs to reach out more to civil society, the question I have is, is uh, civil society, are the NGOs uh, also driven by sectarianism, in, or is engagement with civil society a way to get around, um, around this card? Definitely, when we talk about civil society, we have to um, uh, make a difference between uh, charity organization, religious, <laughs> religious organization, which is totally sectarian. And we, when we talk civil society, NGOs, democracy uh, forces in Iraq, the NGOs, democracy forces, you know, I never honestly, to be in my 10 years in Iraq, never seen a civic NGO leaders believe in sectarian. I've seen, I mean, my colleagues sitting here, you know, when there is a problem between the Kurds and the, uh, the Hadba in Mosul, 
It is not solved by the U.S. It is not solved by anybody. It's solved by a small organization called a Tahrir Organization in Mosul. There is an organization, um, Iraq Civic Action Network, you know, built a kind of um, legislative campaign. They brought people from Anbar, from Diyala, from Salah al-Din to Hilla. And the first time when they went to Hilla, it, this is totally, I mean, my Iraqi friends who are sitting here understand when you take somebody from Anbar to Hilla and you think, it is, oh my God, where am I going to go? Literally, the next week, the local government of these four governorate met in Hilla on recommendation of the civil society. It is like you need to go there. You know, we have an organization, I don't want to make uh, advertisement for my program here, but we have an organization while all the you know the government iraqi government and the u.s government invest in reconciliation in conferences bring the leaders to sit in a conference this organization say no this is not going to work we need to go to the local community themselves understand analysis and to create what is the root of the problem and then basically we, we can talk about solving it but we're bringing Saleh al-Mutlaq and al-Maliki to sit together. They sit together and, they, and then the next day, they are in government. They are, you know, one is the prime minister and then one is deputy prime minister. So there is no reconciliation on the leader level. You need to go to the community. And we have the ingredient for that. Civil society is capable. And also, it, I mean, with little institution capacity. I mean, we're talking about NGOs like five years for five people. But still, there is a big hope there. And if there is an Iraqi Iraqi talk, then the civil society, not political party. Okay. Uh, question. Um, here. Second row. Yes. No, up, up front, please. Sorry. Yeah. <coughs> My name's Li Yang. I just wonder what kind of plan or effort they have, whether it's uh, oil or land or private ownership of the properties, whether it's toward a socialist or toward capitalism, and whether there's any kind of transfer of property by now from maybe then owner or proprietors to maybe dictators or some other abuse of power. Thank you. And then behind you, please. Hi, my name is Sabelle Cocker, and I'm with USAID. And I'm sorry to harp on the civil society question, but it's such an interesting one. Uh, Mr. Uh, al Jabori, you mentioned um, that the strong civil society right now is part of the American legacy, which I'm, I'm very surprised to hear. And I would, I'd love if you could elaborate a little bit on how and why that happened. Thank you. <coughs> uh, I mean, sorry, before you answer, one more question in the back here. Thank you, Erol Jebeji, Seta DC. What are the chances if the, the Sunnis in Iraq feels uh, that they are uh, isolated politically and then there is no way that they can operate in the political life? And what are the chances that they will withdraw from the system entirely and then this will eventually lead to uh, an, an autonomy or even a, a separate country, and if that happens, what happens to Kurdish also? So what are the chances that this is going to take the country to a uh, disintegration? And uh, what is there that the, the American government could do to prevent that? Thank you. <coughs> okay, I think that's obviously an important question, and I will, will park it to the side and allow you to answer the questions on civil society and property transfer. Um, do you want to go to the Sunni political thing? Well, yeah, oh. let's answer that last. Yeah. So. Okay. For the ownership and land, land in Iraq is basically uh, owned by government. And who is in the, in the office of government control the land. So the land belongs to the government, although, you know, as in a, and if they're for housing, for something, it is the government who give you that land. So they still control I will give you a small land to build your house on it, unless you are wealthy and you can buy it. <coughs> so the on politically connected. Exactly, on the 
or politically corrupted. No, not connected. <laughs> um, for the civil society, it's, you know, civil society it's, wasn't immune from whatever happened in Iraq. I mean, especially earlier. When you don't have a civil society and we have a lot of contractors going there, the program is, um, it is, people want to burn money, including the military. So it's basically, people went where's the money. So there is no kind of uh, driven mission organization. But, uh, you know, after three, four years, they start figuring, we lost the connection to our people. We start being called an agent of the U.S. We start being called, uh, you don't even do care about your community. And also because we start throwing a lot of money and that suddenly it is easy to establish an NGO. Um, but uh, I mean, I have somebody who's established in his car going from one contractor to another contractor. But end of the day, there are people who just, you know, civil society itself is part of the political system. And there are a lot of individual leaders within civil society. They didn't find a place for them with the political party. It is basically, literally, there is no opinion for them. It is controlled by the head of the political party. There is no advancement. There is no discussion. So these people who believed there is other way to do, to be effective in Iraq, they start their NGOs. And if these people sitting in Mosul and in Basra, but again, with sustainable money for them, and I'm not talking money, money, I'm talking $25,000, $20,000, but you tell somebody to work on a project for five years. I will start with you. I hand, I mean, hold your hand, you know, for five years, but after five years, I want to see you here. And that's exactly the success of civil society. You know, they're holding local government accountable right now. they holding the government accountable. They, I mean, within the means they have. I'm not saying the civil society is the U.S. civil society. But that's where long-term, I mean, I go back to that, long-term investment, bold civil society organization, and they get a, an, a credibility within community, you know, credibility with the U.S., a credibility <coughs> with even the political system. Now, even with the, uh, I'm sorry, I will take one extra minute. Now when the trouble between Iraqiyya and Dawlat uh, al-Qanun, you find both Dawlat al-Qanun and al-Iraqiyya going to civil society say, can you bring people together, make them understand what is going on? That's the civil society, that's the hope I'm talking about it. And then the, French, uh, the friendship. You don't find Abdul Aziz Jarba from Mosul talking bad about Fatma al-Bahadli in Basra. You don't. You know, they are a friend, they call each other. They, when there is a problem in Iraq, they say, how can we work it to solve it together? Okay, so would a, a decentralization, a disintegration of the centralized state of Iraq be a good thing? It's, can, can I, <laughs> yes. I, can I weigh in on that? Um, not, not under the present circumstances, because it, what, I mean, what we're seeing happen right now is the four Sunni majority provinces and two formally, uh, Anbar and Diyala, are signaling that their distrust, their fear of, of a consolidation of power in Baghdad um, is, is leading them to believe that they have to insulate themselves from the government of Baghdad by seeking regional autonomy in, in a way that was unthinkable for them a few years ago. And the, the problem is that there's no province of Iraq that can be soft partitioned away from the rest without causing conflict. The fault lines run through practically every province, certainly uh, the four Sunni majority ones that, that we're talking about. So uh, that, that will signal a, a, a civil conflict, if not a civil war, if it happens. What actually the struggle on this is one of our mistakes, too. What we told the local people, you have the power. But we didn't educate the center that these people have the power. So suddenly, the local council, they have all the power in their hand, but their budget is tied by the central government. So you kind of tell me you have a power, and you don't have 
to act on that power. So that's create a lot of a problem itself. It's like, you know, and then the law, the local government law, is clear in the Constitution. You know, they have a power, they have their own budget, they have whatever, but then they cannot spend that budget because the ministry, the central ministries, control that budget. So a lot of local government in Iraq, provincial council, they send 90% of their budget for that year back to the law, to the central government, and the central government uh, blame them, saying, we gave them budget. They didn't, you know, they didn't want to give you surface for political gain again. So it's like the laws itself. It is the, this is what the institution. You don't give people power with no legal frame for that to be basically fought. And the legal frame is not there. There is no kind of this connection. And then when you create it in the Constitution, you say you have the right to be a federal state. But then it comes, well, the political situation right now is not right for it. Or, you know, if you create your federal state, it will be refuge for the Ba'athist. You know, I was talking to Joel yesterday. If the, all the Ba'athists want to go to Salah al-Din, then we solve maybe part of the problem itself. So these are the things that need be be able to think about it before we just saying, oh, central government, local government, federal government, we need to solve the, um, the laws that govern this. Just and, and very quickly, yeah, part I of this really is a centralization issue, and part of this is the central government wanting to do things. Part of this, though, is a training issue. You know, anyone who's lived in a bureaucracy, whether it's a foundation or a government or an institution, and you know, and tried to buy a package full of pens and found out that that took, you know, a purchase order and three cross signatures and you know a stamp from you know, and it's hard to do, and it's. I mean, I've, I've watched you know, budget execution rates. And yes, some of it is malign and the central government intended to keep money. Some of it really is just institutional immaturity and not physically being able to move money um, down to lower levels, not having the institutional mu muscle memory to do that. I think we need to distinguish between immaturity and, and malice. Okay, not sorry, what, what, can you clarify on what the Constitution says on this point of centralization and, and decentralization and in terms of local government power and control? Uh -huh. Because you know this is a big, was a big issue in Tunisia uh -huh. and it, it, it has the potential <laughs> to be disruptive. The Constitution says that, that any Iraqi governorate or any combination of governorates can, uh, can request a referendum uh, which the Iraqi Electoral Commission w is, su is supposed to run, and if the referendum passes, then that, that, uh, that governorate or collection of governorates becomes a federal region with, this, with similar powers um, to, to that that the Kurdistan regional government has right now. They, they have their own regional guard force, they have their own budget, they have control of, to some measure of, of, the, of the resources, and so on. I mean, the Constitution is clear. You can get your uh, federal or region. But the, the way it made, according to the Constitution, you go to the election commission and you ask them how to organize the referendum. And somehow, the regulation, the election commission has to have approval from the prime minister. Yeah. So then the prime minister is controlling it again. If there is no approval, I cannot do it. And that's exactly what happened in Salah. Or, or if there's no election commission. Which or there's, I mean, there, there's the in election fact, commission. no election commission right now. Okay, we have a question here. Please. Yes, if you can. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, my friends up there, but also, sir. Um, can you I, identify yourself? Yeah, my name is Laura Lai Kelly. <coughs> I'm a national security wonk for many years here in D.C. Um, my question, I, I just want to say I really admire all of you. Thank you so much for spending time in Iraq and then coming back and sharing your experiences with us. My question is, um, what is the possibility, uh, since we've had the military surge, we had the civilian surge with not great results, what do you think is the possibility for basically a civil society surge in Iraq? Is there the capacity or the on-ramps in civil society to accept help productively from the rest of the world in the non-governmental sector. So we create these sort of mediating devices that build, build a parallel system, basically, for the citizens outside of the government, which might be dysfunctional in the short term or in the long term. 
um, could we create some kind of a portal that allows projects to get matched and money to go to the micro level? Is that possible in today's world in the, the sort of social entrepreneurship and distributed technology and microfinancing on cell phones that we have available to us? Is it possible if somebody s set up a way to do that to move forward? Again, I said there is a hope in civil society. I didn't say they are the savior for us. Um, um, civil society also, they have their own challenge, internal challenge and external. The government is still control who is registered, who is not. And, you know, I mean, uh, my colleagues remember there when we were there under Order 45, there is 12 or 13,000, Ahmed, 13,000 Iraqi organization registered. Well, under the new law, so far there is 150 or organization registered, and of the 150, I think 101 belong to either MBs or political leader. So uh, can we depend on the civil society? We need to do it gradually. We don't want to call the civil society. We don't want to basically, you know, um, uh, you know, because the government doesn't work, then we have to, because the community is told, you know, it is premature to do all that work. But if we have a plan like five, six years, 10 years from now, little by little, I think that civil society can rise to that challenge. I, I mean, I would interject that. I mean, civil society, I, I, I agree with Rahman that there's great potential. And those of us who, you know, were in Iraq saw it. Uh, it was shocking, the, the resiliency of, of some aspects of civil society, especially in the South. But um, I would add that Iraqi civil society at, in just about every place is under terrible pressure from all sides, from, from whether it's from militant Islamist groups or whether it's from local political factions or whether it's from the government itself. Because there, there are a great many forces, ascendant forces in Iraq right now who are threatened by a sort of a third way, a civil society, uh, civil society or organizations. And you see, I think, you, you see at the local level, uh, the government actually in some cases moves to try to atomize civil society. They try to co-opt or to, or to break uh, civil society organizations that, that they can't control. In the South, you have the solder movement, which for whom civil society organizations are a competitor, as, this, as the solderists try to do their grassroots uh, sort of, you know, seizure of the Iraqi of Iraqi society, a la Lebanese Hezbollah. Um, so th these these groups are under enormous pressure right now. Political conditions at the top just exacerbate that, and I, I just hope that we can we can help these these groups survive the next five years or so. I mean, thank you for reminding me of this. Look, uh, for civil society is growing right now because there is really the fighting between political party. And if we get a dictatorship again in Iraq, then we will not have civil society too because there is no space for them. They will basically uh, demolished. And again, we have to be careful with civil society. What the project? Is it the community uh, beneficiary of this or us? And that's the different uh, approach too. If it is us, just forget it because we are creating another challenge for you know, good forces in Iraq. Well, yeah, I'm sure in Iraq, the question of what is civil society is a very complex one. But, but Doug, I'll yeah, let I, I, you know, if, if you, uh, you know, I'm a political theorist by training. If you read the early civil society writers, the institutions they primarily talk about are economic ones. And, uh, you know, I'm going to come back to my, my emphasis on commerce. I'm, uh, I'm a huge fan of microfinance, Laura, but, you know, microfinance only works when you have macrofinance markets for them to sell to. If we don't have a, you know, robust, diversified economy in Iraq, it's hard to see these civil society institutions surviving for the long term. And again, I'm going to, I really think that's how America can best help Iraq. Um, there, uh, you, no, you've not. But you, you know that you know the country. They're natural business people. Um, we do it well. Yes, it is really hard to do business in Iraq, but we do business in lots of hard places all around the world. Um, it can be done. Um, it you know it doesn't always take eight months to get a visa. Um, 
we that's that is again is the the way forward for the US Iraq relationship is robust promotion of commerce and you know if we had if we flip the number of commercial officers in embassy Baghdad with the number of public diplomacy officers that we have I think we'd be much much better off okay um, I'm conscious of the fact that we have not discussed regional implications um, if there is some kind of question along those lines I'd be happy to take one Oh, sorry, you, you've you had one, so I'll, I'll let the gentleman behind you speak. I'm Lincoln Day. I'm a retired sociologist and demographer. Uh, we've heard a lot of interesting things said about politics and economics uh, here, uh, but politics and economics have to work inevitably within a natural environment. I get the impression from talking to people who have been to Iraq and um, also just uh, reading the newspaper uh, that a very messy uh, thing, a very, it's a very messy place economically or right, environmentally now. All of that uh, material from war, debris, and uh, toxic mater uh, things, materials, things of that sort. Um, you've mentioned the loss of electricity, which in a modern uh, society is a very serious loss, uh, but there must have been great damage to the soil to um, water levels, uh, things of that sort. And I just wonder, uh, mustn't this uh, be taken into consideration and isn't this setting limits on what you can do politically and economically? Thank you. Uh, we'll take a few more here. Yeah. I'm Rick Brennan from the Rand Corporation. Um, let me just kind of uh, bring it back into the, the re a regional perspective then to try to raise an issue for you. Uh, as we've seen the political process in Iraq t uh, transpire over the last several years, uh, there's a relationship going on right now, that, as you know, where the uh, Prime Minister Maliki is viewed uh, uh, by the Saudi king as somebody that can't be trusted as an Iranian tool. You've seen the shift that Joel has talked about where uh, you're, you're seeing the Iraqis support pro programs that are, that are against us, uh, that uh, both in Bahrain and in Saudi Arabia. Uh, in Syria, and we're we're starting to see the GCC starting to take to isolate or to move away from some of what what is going on in Iraq. So, what are the things that we can do, given that that you're seeing a closer and closer relationship of Iraq with with Iran uh, and the the Sunni and GCC co countries, they're, and they're looking at at the situation and, and looking at Iran as a threat to their security. What are the types of things that we can tr tr to do? to bring Iraq back into the fold and make them part of a, a broader regional friend rather than look at seeing them slide closer and closer to, to Iran. Okay, I'm gonna let each of you tackle this question starting with Doug. Look, we need, we need to accept that Iraq has its own interests. And just as a matter of policy, they are almost always going to sympathize with the the you know the Shia population of an of a country, whether that's the you know minority regime in uh, Damascus or whether that's the majority repressed fraction in Bahrain, that's that's just going to be their interest, and we need to understand that it's not about us, and it's not about can, you know if we didn't exist, that would still be their policy. So we need to understand that's not about us, and they're countering us. Um, that said. Uh, we do need to take steps to integrate them better into the region. Um, I still, you know, if you've, you know, Rick and I have, uh, have worked together many times before. He's got more time on the ground in Iraq than Joel and I put together. Um, it, we, we need to find ways to, to move these relationships forward. And I still think that as the American withdrawal becomes more and more apparent to the Iraqis, and as the implications of that fully play out, the distinctions between Iraq and Iran will come to the surface, will become more politically salient, will bubble up as the most relevant issues in Iraqi politics, um, and I think we'll, we will then see that, that swing away. I think we're still seeing this natural alliance between the two states, um, in part to counter the fact that we did have 50,000 guys sitting there. I, I couldn't agree, disagree with that more. Um, the, uh, the Iraqi policy toward Syria is not a sectarian one. Um, they, 
the Assad regime behaved in Iraq for many years as a Sunni power, pushing al-Qaeda in Iraq into Iraq to kill thousands of the Iraqi Shia. And it was just a little over two years ago that the prime minister called for a UN tribunal to investigate the Assad regime for, for its involvement in the bombings in August 2009 in Baghdad. So this shift of policy is a Maliki shift of policy. It's an artificial one that's been done in concert with the Iranian regime's attempt to shore up its regional ally. Um, it, so I, I think the sectarian policy of the Maliki government is artificial. If there were proper power sharing in Iraq, if there, were, if there was a proper foreign policy formulated on the shared interests of all the Iraqi parties, you would not see them adopting a sectarian regional policy. You would not see them trying to prop up the Assad regime. You would not see them favoring intervention into the Bahrain crisis to destabilize <coughs> it there. Um, what can be done to insulate Iraq from Iranian influence was Rick's question. I don't believe, I do, I, I agree with Doug that in the very long term that there is an Iraqi inoculation to, to uh, Iranian influence. It's distasteful to, to Iraqis. Iraqis are very nationalist. They would reject it if they had the means over time. But the Iraq, Iraqi politics lies prone before Iranian influence right now. And, and Iraqis have to be political survivors. They have to accommodate themselves to the prevailing power just to get through the week and survive. And that's what they're doing with respect to the Iranian regime right now. So in the near term, you are not going to see the natural Iraqi antipathy to Iranian influence come out. Even amongst the, the uh, um, uh, the Iraqi Shia of, of far southern Iraq are the most anti-Iranian Iraqis that I, that I met uh, because they were on the front lines of the Iran-Iraq war and bore the brunt of it, and they have a very long memory of that. This will kick in at some point in time, but it's not going to be in the near term. And the crisis that we have to concern ourselves with in the region, the potential for a regional sectarian conflict, the potential chaos in Syria that could spill over, these things are happening in the near term. So we can't afford to just sort of let events take their course over a generation. We have to do things to, to insulate Iraq from undue running influence now. Rahman, in yeah. just a couple of minutes, we, yeah. we, I mean, we'll be closing, um, so if you I can know, answer uh, briefly. You know, Iranian influence in Iraq, it is not just Shia influence in Iraq, mm -hmm. because we talk politics. The Iranian has connection to all the political part, all political leaders in Iraq. No difference between Tariq al-Hashmi and al-Maliki. All they have connection to Iran, and the Kurds too. And if you tell Jalal Talabani, if you choose between the US and the Iranian, who you choose as a friend? He will choose the Iranian, because they are next door. They respond quickly for him. They have leverage in the Iraqi politics. For the Saudi and you know, um, Iraq, I think this is more struggle beyond the Arab Spring, Who's going to be lead the Arab port? Literally historical is there are four countries who kind of set the agenda for the Arab uh, nation. Saudi with their money, Iraq with their military and political force, and Egypt and Syria. Egypt and Syria are not a player right now. So there is a struggle between Iraq and Saudi. Who will be the next leader that the Arab listen to? And then they mix it with a little bit of the sectarian part, Sunni Shi'i. So it is really economical struggle who is going to control and political struggle who is going to control more than, you know, the, those are close to Iran, those are close to. I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, I want to thank our panelists for um, coming forth and giving us such great. Uh, analysis on this very complex problem. I feel like we should have a, a vote. <laughs> like yeah, like the Doha debates, um, but I'm not sure what we would be voting for. Um, <laughs> um, although I can see that one would be a positive uh, outlook and one would be a negative. But um, again, thank you, thanks everyone for coming out and thanks to the panelists. Thank you. Thanks.